All right, let's open up in your Bibles to the book of Numbers, chapter 6. Numbers, chapter 6. As we continue our study here on, at our midweek study through the Bible, through the book of Numbers. And tonight we hit a portion of scripture that is one of our favorites, really. Because... By the end of Numbers chapter 6, we're actually going to spend some time looking at what we do almost every service, is what we call the benediction at the end of the service. You're going to find that's at the end of Numbers chapter 6, where it is the plan of God that the priests would bless the people in the name of God. And we're going to apply all of that. But before then, we have something very, very special, and that is the understanding and the explanation of what the Nazarite vow is. Now, before we start, when you hear the, the Nazarite vow, you've probably heard of it. I think Samson in the Bible was probably the most famous, or maybe I should say infamous, of people who took the Nazarite vow. We often think, oh, the Nazarite vow, like Jesus was a Nazarite. But that's actually not what it means. The, the Hebrew word Nazarite is a person who is marked out for a special time of separation. So the Nazarite vow actually has nothing to do with Nazareth. Does it make sense? But oftentimes you hear, oh, the, the Nazarite vow, you're like, oh, Jesus. No, no. Jesus was from and he was raised in Nazareth. But the Nazarite vow and Nazareth are not the same thing. So we're going to look at this special vow that some people would take to be consecrated for the Lord. And we're going to make application all the way through. So let's start together in Numbers chapter 6, picking up in verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, When either a man or woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord... He shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice or eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head. Until the days are fulfilled in which he has separated himself to the Lord, he shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of his hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean even for his father or his mother, or his brother, or his sister, when they die, because his separation to God is on his head. All the days of his separation, he shall be holy to the Lord. Now, we begin simply with the Lord speaking to Moses, saying, speak to the children of Israel. Now, this is a common Thing that we find in the book of Numbers, isn't it? The Lord is speaking to Moses, and Moses is speaking to the children of Israel. And from time to time, I think it's important that we are reminded that God is not speaking directly to the people. God is speaking to Moses, who is functioning as a mediator between God and people. So do you remember when they were on Mount Sinai? They said, look, we do not want to see the Lord. So Moses, you talk to the Lord. And tell us what he said. And Moses is functioning as a mediator. Now, we know as the New Testament happens, who is the mediator between God and man? The man Christ Jesus. You should memorize it. That's in 
your Bible, there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So Moses is a type or a picture or a shadow of Jesus who is ultimately the mediator. Now this is what I want to tell you. No pastor is the mediator between you and God. No priest, no special teacher, that's not biblical. Moses was a forerunner for Jesus, and Jesus is the mediator between us and God. So although God will use a pastor or a speaker or a person in unique ways, I don't have like a special line to God. Not any different than the same line that you have to God, and who is that? Jesus, the mediator. And the beauty of prayer is, my prayer isn't more heard than anybody else's. No special pastor who God uses in a special way can hear from God better than anybody else. We all pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. And that's why prayer is such a sweet thing. Because no matter who you are or where you've been or how bad your day is, if you have a faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus, then you can just talk to the Father and he's got a ready ear because you are his child. Jesus broke down the middle wall of separation between God and man. The pre Moses or the priestly function was temporary until God could make permanent the relationship for us with Jesus. And I want you, brothers and sisters, my friends, I want you to get deep into the things of God. I want your house to be a house of prayer. I want when we gather together, our house would be a house of prayer. Because we all have equal access to the Father because of the perfections of Jesus. Not one of us has access because of how good we've done or how good the day went or if you did a good ministry. No, our access is solely because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. God's forgiveness offers us fellowship with God. And prayer is the word that we use. We only pray to God. That's the, we have a special word for it. Why? Because me and you, we can talk. You and your friend, your neighbor, your spouse, you can talk. But you pray to God because that relationship is unique. And I'm here to tell you, listen, one of the things that I'm praying about the most is, God, how do we make Crossroads a house of prayer? How do you and I choose to be intentional about taking that time and seeking the Lord. And when you get together with your friends, just spending time seeking the Lord. I want God to make this a house of prayer. You know why? Because when we are a house of prayer, we will all be on mission with the Lord. Because it's in prayer that God gives his marching orders. That's where God says, listen, I don't want you to be that way. I want you to stop doing that. Hey, you need to get a new job. You need to get busy doing this thing. It happens in prayer. That's where God reveals it. If you're just busy going about your life without taking the time to be set apart, to hear from the Lord, you're just going to do what comes naturally. And isn't that the problem in our lives? What comes naturally is not God's will and plan. It's our wills and plans. So Moses is a picture or a symbol of Jesus. He is the mediator between God and the people. But when Jesus comes, we need no other mediator except God's own son. But what does the Lord tell Moses to tell the people? He says, when either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord. Now you notice this. All of God's people are separated, but now there's a group of people who say, I really want to be set apart for the Lord. Now, you, you realize that, that you and I get to be as set apart for the Lord as you actually want to be. You realize that. Your relationship with God will be as deep as you desire it to be. And you can imagine for a, a child of Israel, they're, they're seeing, they're doing all the, the different rituals, and they're doing all the ceremonies and the celebrations, and they're bringing in their offerings. And then there's some people who are like, you know what, I want to go deeper. I want to go deeper in the things of God. And then God says, look, for those who want to consecrate an offering of the vow of the Nazarite, they're saying, this is a special offering of myself. Now, I'm here to tell you this. I think all of us, should think of ourselves as a 
our personal offering to the Lord. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans, chapter 12? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I mean, talk about a paradox. Living sacrifices. You realize that that makes absolutely no sense, right? How can you be a living sacrifice? It is a paradox because we are dying to ourselves and we are sacrificing ourselves, our self-styled life to the Lord. And, and Paul, inspired by the Spirit, writing to the church in Rome says, look, I beseech you. Now that's an old word. It means I implore you. I beg of you. By the mercy, I beg of you in God's mercy that you present your body as a living sacrifice. He's saying, look, he's pleading with this church he's starting. Or this church that he wants to go to. Because he didn't start the church in Rome. He wants to go visit him. He's like, look, I want you to give yourself to the Lord as a living sacrifice. He says, this, when you do that, your sacrifice is holy. It's acceptable, which is your reasonable service. We should all see ourselves not as, well, I do just enough of the things of God to have a relationship with him. But we should all say, God, I want to be all the way in. I want all that you are for me in Christ to be made manifest in my life. I want my life to be a living sacrifice, Lord, that whatever you want to do with this life, God, I am game. Because that is the abundant life. No halfway. No, I kind of do the Jesus thing. No. You can't be a partial sacrifice. So there's a number of stipulations here. Notice first in verses 3 and 4. He shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor any fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. Now, we have to realize that in, in that culture, wine was a very common beverage. It, it's, it's common today, and I realize that in 21st century America, we have all sorts of alcoholism and all these things, but wine was very common in Jesus' day. Most people drank wine. Drunkenness was a problem that day. That's why it's in the Bible that we have to be careful. But it was a common drink. Like in a lot of ways, wine in that culture was like soda pop is today. So the idea of being separated from drinking wine would be the normal beverage that you would drink at your table. So I grew up in an all-Italian family. I grew up, my grandfather, my grandmother, my father, they had a glass of wine every single meal for dinner. I never saw any of them. They never drank to excess, which is a unique situation, but it was a very common beverage. And in a lot of ways, that's analogous to the way wine functioned in that culture. So to be separated from it, it would be like, look, if, if God said, look, if you want to be set apart, you probably don't want to drink any soda. And listen, it's not a bad thing. Soda's not so good for you. But it's a very common drink. And not only wine, but now you have any sort of vinegar, because all of you love to drink vinegar for fun. <laughs> I got stories about I'm not even going to go there. But, and then, of course, grape juice, which, so any of the fruit of the vine. Now, it even goes so far, not only drinks from the fruit of the vine, but something as simple as raisins, or for those of you who are uh, dealing with regularity, uh, prunes would be out the question, too. <laughs> so, yeah, that's consecrated in a whole different type of way. But the, but the idea is God provides the fruit of the vine, and so there is a voluntary separation from any of the fruits of the vine for this period of consecration. Right? So there is a, a drink, a Food prohibition. And then, of course, when you get to verse 5, look at what it says. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall 
be holy, then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. Now, no, I am not under a Nazarite vow. I like my peanut butter and jelly, thank you very much. But some, every once in a while when someone, you know, because st- I still get those, you know, like, oh, man, how could you be a pastor and you have that hair? And I say, I'm a Nazarite. You got to, like, what's that? I'm like, oh, you got to read your Bible instead of judging me. <laughs> Actually, I don't really say that. I want to say that, though, because God's doing a work in my life. But there was this consecration. Now, you can imagine, because having your hair growing all wild wasn't the most common thing in that day. Even though people had their hair longer in that culture than they did now, the idea was no razors shall come up on your head. So not only was the beard growing, but the hair was growing for the guys. The hair was growing for the gals. And it was a sign of, I am... I am just letting myself be in the presence of God as God would make me. And you have to realize that, that all of our grooming is all us trying to be different than we were made naturally. You know that, right? Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't want you to do it. And I'm not saying that you ladies, that you shouldn't paint the house if it needs painting or whatever. You know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't shave if you you have a splotchy beard or whatever. But the idea here is is they're, they're letting themselves be as God made them. And for this period, it doesn't have to be for all the time, but for this period, no hair was to be cut at all. And it, it was allowed to remain relatively unkept. Because the idea here is you're focusing on something different. You're focusing on the relationship with God as opposed to maybe the more superficial parts of life. So there is the separation from any sort of grooming in that way. Now, of course, in verse 6, all the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister when they die, because the separation to God is upon his head. Now, I think we all primarily, unless it's our job, have a a personal prohibition against touching dead bodies, right? But remember, in this culture, if you were to touch a dead body, you were considered ceremonially unclean. We've studied that a lot, haven't we? And I keep making the point that part of that was to curb the spread of disease as if a body is dead or if there is a, a corpse that is rotting that could spread disease and God was concerned about the health of the people. But here we see that it's not just a general Don't touch a dead body. It's like if you have this vow that you've set yourself apart for the Lord, even if a father or a mother or a brother or sister, even your nearest of kin, if they were to die, because of the vow that you've made, you are not to engage in that part of your family. So this is not a small thing. In that culture, when somebody died, like a lot in our culture, there's a big deal that gets made about it. And so this is saying, it's like remember when Aaron's sons died? Didn't God tell Moses, listen, I do not want you to wail or mourn. Now you can imagine, because of the place that he was a priest, and he was not supposed to mourn for his sons, because it was unbecoming of the witness of the priests. Same kind of idea here. Even if your nearest of kin were to die, you do not defile yourselves by touching their body. Very unique. It It was out of context with the culture. Again, why? Because they're separated unto the Lord. Now look at what happens. In verse 9, it says, But if anyone dies very suddenly beside him, and he defiles his consecrated head, then he shall shave his head on the day of his cleansing. On the seventh day he shall shave it. Then on the eighth day he shall bring two turtle doves, or two young pigeons to the priest, to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And the priest shall offer one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering and make atonement for him because he sinned in regard to the corpse and he shall sanctify his head that same day. He shall consecrate to the Lord the days of his separation and bring a male lamb in its first year as a trespass offering. But the former days shall be lost because his separation was defiled. Now, it's interesting because you can imagine... There's these prohibitions, and imagine all of a sudden he's working or he's doing something, and somebody dies and he touches them. What do I do now? And we have this whole ritual that 
if in the midst of their consecration, in the midst of their vows, somebody dies, again, the first thing he does is he shaves his head on the seventh day after he touches it. It's the day of cleansing. And then there is all of the different rituals. On the eighth day after the head gets shaved, then there's all the different. There's the sin offering and there's the trespass offering. There's all these different animals offered to cover the breaking of his vow. Right? And then he starts over again. So the idea here is that if you don't complete your vow, God still wants you to take care of it. Now, at this point, I think it makes sense because some of them say, well, okay, so what's up with all these vows? What did Jesus say about vows? Anybody remember? Jesus said, don't make vows. Why? Because our yes should be yes and our no should be no. And anything else is from the what? From the evil one. So Jesus said, don't make vows. Because what he's saying is that our lives should have so much integrity that we don't need to make a vow. How many times has somebody said, oh, you know, like you say, oh, this thing, and you're like, oh, no, and they don't believe you. You're like, oh, I swear to God. Now, I know you guys don't say that because you're good church people. But I swear, I swear, right? That, what, that is an implication that our yes isn't yes and our no isn't no. And we should live our lives in such a way that we don't need to make promises. I, I swear on my kids. I swear on my mom. I swear on this. I swear on that. We shouldn't have to do any of that because people should know that when we speak, our words have weight. That we do what we say. That we say what we mean. That if we make a commitment, we follow through on those things. Jesus said we don't need to make vows. But people did. There's provisions for it. But Jesus reminds us, you don't need to make a vow. Just follow the Lord and be a person of integrity. But so if there's an accidental death, there's this whole thing that goes on. Now, in verse 13, we kind of get the completion ritual here. It says, now this is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he shall be brought to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall present his offerings to the Lord, one male lamb in its first year without blemish as a burnt offering... One ewe lamb in its first year without blemish as a sin offering. One ram without blemish as a peace offering. A basket of unleavened bread, cakes of fine flour mixed with oil, unleavened wafers anointed with oil, and their grain offering with their drink offerings. Then the priest shall bring them before the Lord, offer his sin offering and his burnt offering, and he shall offer the ram as a sacrifice, a peace offering to the Lord, with the baskets of unleavened bread, the priest shall also offer its grain offering and its drink offering. Then the Nazarite shall shave his consecrated head at the door of the tabernacle of meeting and shall take the hair from his consecrated head and put it onto the fire which is under the sacrifice of the peace offering. And the priest shall take the boiled shoulder of the ram, one unleavened cake from the basket and one unleavened wafer and put them upon the the hands of the Nazarite after he has shaved his consecrated head. And the priest shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. They are holy for the priest, together with the breast of the wave offering and the thigh of the heave offering. After that, the Nazarite may drink wine. This is, verse 21, the law of the Nazarite, who vows to the Lord an offering for his separation, besides that, whatever else his hand is able to provide according to the vow which he takes, he must do according to the law of his separation. Now, don't miss this. So imagine, there's a person who wants to be consecrated to the Lord. They want to really grow, and so they, they say, I'm not going to have any of the fruit of the vine. There's going to be no drink. There's going to be no grape juice. There's going to be no prunes, raisins, all this stuff. I'm not, I'm not going to take care of my hair. It's just going to be growing. And then I'm not going to touch any dead bodies. And if a family member dies, I love you. And I loved you when, I, when you were alive. But I can't go near you because I have this consecration to the Lord. And by the time it's over, in order for the, con the vow to end, there's all these offerings. Now, if you weren't here when we did the book of Leviticus, we went over every single one of these offerings, how they function, what they mean. And so I'll refer you back to the studies that we did uh, in our series in the beginning of the book of Leviticus, because we dealt with every one. There's a chapter on each one, so there's a message on each one, how it works. But don't miss this, that when the person was done with their consecration, they offered all sorts of offerings that all had to do with the cleansing of sin. 
Now, why do I bring this up? Because sometimes people who love the Lord and say, I'm consecrated for the Lord, they start to think that they don't make any mistakes. Spiritual self-righteousness starts to take over. Right, where all of a sudden it's like, I've been walking real strong with the Lord, and now I just think that I don't really need Jesus because I'm so consecrated. You ever met someone like that? Don't hit your spouse. <laughs> Listen, I've been around church long enough. I've met a lot of people who are more spiritual than Jesus. At least they think so. A lot of people like that. But after this great vow of consecration, where all this stuff goes on, you are still a sinner in need of a savior. And that's an important lesson, because I think what happens is, is when we start to walk strong with the Lord, oftentimes Satan kind of gets us off into this place of pride and vanity where we think we're better than other people, or more holy than other people, and then other people, you really need to listen to me because I got it all together. And the gospel says that just ain't reality. What I've learned is that the people who truly walk with Jesus, they are humble because each and every day they realize their absolute need for salvation. Every single day they say, man, I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the fact that God still loves me still blows my mind. See, our hearts are like an onion. There's always another layer. Sometimes God's dealing with these big things, and sometimes he's dealing with these big things, but they're really subtle. And if you walk in the light as he is in the light, if you walk with the God of all creation who is perfect, you can never think that you got it together. Because no matter how much you grow, you're like, man, I am so not together. But it would be really easy. Imagine someone's like, oh, I'm going to do a five-year Nazarite vow. Right? And so for five years, they're like, oh, yeah, sorry. I can't have any of that wine. I got a Nazarite vow and got great dreads at that point. I, I, I overlooked the whole locks thing. But, you know, I got this great head of hair, you know, and they haven't touched any d dead bodies. And they're set apart for the Lord. Right? You can imagine somebody at that point just thinking that they're big stuff in God's kingdom. When really, if we're truly set apart for God, the only person who we think is big stuff is Jesus. Because Jesus is big stuff. Jesus is the one, if you walk with God, that you're like, man, God's grace is so awesome because God would love me. And that God could see all that's in my heart and all the mistakes that I've made. And he knows all the mistakes that we're going to make. And he still loves us. And he's still for us. And he still believes in us. So it's amazing that once this thing is over, before he even gets or she gets to even cut her hair, there's a whole extensive set of offerings for sin and trespass and all these things that need to happen. Just to remind you that at the end of your vow, you're still somebody who needs God's forgiveness. And listen, I'm here to tell you, as people who love the Lord, and I'm going to assume that the majority of you here, you love the Lord. You have to fight against self-righteousness every day. It's like, remember Bartimaeus who was blind, who Jesus gave his sight to? I, my heart breaks when I find people who God has healed who will look at someone who God hasn't and look down on them. It's like blind Bartimaeus who God has given sight being mad at everybody who's blind. See, the only reason Bartimaeus had sight is because he met with Jesus. And because he met with Jesus, Jesus touched him and healed him. We're just, it's not us versus you. It's, we're all together. The only difference is when Jesus reached out his hand in our direction, we reached back. Our healing is sheer grace. Sheer grace. And we have to be careful. Because what Satan, I believe, loves to do with a sinner who's repented is turn them into a critic simply because God gave them the grace to respond to his love. We should be the most compassionate and generous of spirit people because God has been so radically patient with us. But you know what the problem with self-righteousness that I found? Is that oftentimes we're the last people to see it. Other people, we're, the la we're blind to our own self-righteousness. And my brothers, listen, my sisters, listen. 
It's the self-righteousness of God's kids who they forgave that is pushing people away from Jesus. If you, the, the studies that are coming out about the way people who don't know Jesus, how they view Christianity, almost always it's self-righteous and judgmental. When, if you think about it, I would love to say, oh, they're wrong. They're not wrong. Sometimes we can be self-righteous and judgmental, but if you think about the gospel, we are not righteous. Jesus is, and he shares it with us, and we believe that God is the judge, and we are not. So you see how we get crooked a little bit, don't we? And, and listen, Jesus died on the cross for that too for us. And we need to come to him and say, God, I want you to take away my self-righteousness. I want you to take away my judgmentalism because you're the true judge. And the judge of all creation will judge rightly. And God, the only righteousness that I have is the G- Jesus' righteousness that you share with me by faith. That's the only righteousness we have. And when we stay there, then I believe that God can truly pour his spirit through us. Why? Because no one will try and take credit for what God's doing. But we got to do battle. And I, and I, I was so blown away. I'm like, man, after this great consecration, you get to think, man, this person's so close to the Lord. It's like, well, listen, you got to give all these offerings. And you got to realize that... The, the extensiveness of this offering was also a financial hardship for most people. This was not like a cheap offering. It was like that whole thing cost a lot of money. So not only was there things you shouldn't eat, things you shouldn't do with your, your body, but there was also a financial cost to this as well. Because this whole extensive set of offerings was, in that culture, as it would be today, very, very expensive. But you notice that between how you look, what you eat, what you get yourself involved in, your resources, you start to realize that consecration unto the Lord is holistic, isn't it? Consecration unto the Lord is holistic. It involves the totality of who we are, not just sections of who we are. Now, that's that's tough, isn't it? Because we we're coming out of a, a generation or a time when people were like, I, am, I believe in Jesus, so I, Christianity is my spiritual box, but my Christianity doesn't inform the way I live my life every day, how I do my business. It doesn't inform how I raise my family. It doesn't inform how I spend my money. It doesn't inform for how I steward my body and all these things. But true Christianity is holistic. It, in, it informs everything that we do. The finished work of Jesus is designed to inform every single part of our lives. And I think we need to ask ourselves, God, what are the areas of my life that I will not allow the death and resurrection of Jesus to inform? And you know what I find when I do that, ask that question? There's always some areas. The way that I think about this person the way that I choose to, what I'm going to be entertained by, the way that I spend my resources, the way that I think about this issue that's a big issue that I'm wondering about. God, if he is the Lord, needs to inform every area of our lives. Our consecration needs to be total and not specific. It needs to be complete and holistic. And for all of us, I believe that there's encouragement and a challenge there, isn't there? I've, that's funny, I was talking with Pastor Bill about this a couple weeks ago. I said, you know, in everybody's life, there's always something, right? One area is strong, another area is, man, that's a kind of a train wreck. And I've kind of found that, that in almost everybody's life, there's always there's that one thing that just isn't together. And we struggle with those areas. And so listen, and Pastor Bill was like, yeah, he's like, in, in, in my years of walking the Lord, I've always found there's, there's always some area that needs God's grace to prop up. So I believe for all of us, every single one of us here, every single one of us who's watching online or is checking this out, what's those areas that we struggle to let God put under his authority? And just simply come to him and just confess it. Just agree with God. God, I struggle to let you be Lord in this area. 
And God, I want you to do a work. I want you to do a work. One final note on the Nazarite vow. I love the phrase, their consecrated head. Brothers and sisters, you need to be consecrated heads. That, that word consecration means to set apart. It's what, it's what the Nazarite, that word actually means, to be set apart. And your head should be set apart. We should think with the thoughts of Christ. We should meditate on good things and beautiful things and praiseworthy things. And you should see your head, which is what leads around your body. You should see it as set apart for the Lord. And I want you to feel free to call each other consecrated heads. Just be like, you're a consecrated head. I mean, that's a bless. You're, you're, you're blessing God. So when you see me later, if you think so, you say, Fusco, you're a consecrated head. I just, I just thought the phrase was super cool. Be, make a great name for a Christian uh, speed metal band. Consecrated head, you musicians. I'll have Pastor Jason and Pastor Brandon write a song called Consecrated Head. But I, I, just, I, thought, I thought the phrase was noteworthy. Now, verse 22. Look at what it says. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. Now, if you're here at Crosses All, we, almost every time I'm here, we do that. But I want you to notice a few things about this. Notice first, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his son saying, this is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Do, do you notice that? God has a specific way he wants to bless his people. God is saying to Moses to say to Aaron and his sons, this is how I want you to bless my people. That's powerful, isn't it? Because there is a specific way that God wants you and I, his kids, to bless his people. God directs his blessings. So if you want to say, God, I want to be blessed so I can be a blessing, we need to say, God, how do you want my life to be a blessing to people? Because you know what happens if we don't realize that God wants to bless his people a specific way? We bless people in the way we think we should. God has a specific way he wants it. And I love that about the Lord. The Lord doesn't leave anything really up to chance. He wants to bless his people. He wants to use Aaron and his sons to bless the people. And in a lot of ways, this prayer functions a lot like Jesus' model prayer. You guys know it, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. What? On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then, of course, Luke's gospel adds for. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forevermore. See, when God inspires a prayer or a blessing, I think we should memorize it. Because it's not in there for no reason. And it's, 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 it's amazing because you think, I just recited Our Father. For a lot of the church, for a long time, that was recited every single time people got together. Now we kind of think it's unspiritual. As if a Holy Spirit-inspired prayer could be unspiritual. I mean, think about it. Now, again, that's not the only way we should pray, right? But we should never neglect when God inspires a blessing or a prayer in his word. We should take it to heart. and We should speak it out to one another. But I love this. This blessing, it's simple it's elegant and it's profound. The Lord bless you and keep you. God, may the Lord bless you. 
God desires to bless people. I mean, think about that. Because so many people think, oh, God's just, he's mean. Like, God's just looking to make my life really hard. If I follow him, I'm never going to get married. And he's going to make me do all this crazy stuff. I'm not going to hate all of it. That's not true. God wants to bless his people. It's like, like, it's like anyone who's a parent, you know, like, I got this little baby girl at home, and a bigger girl, and a bigger boy, and I just want to bless those kids. I just want them to be happy, and I want them to fulfill all that God has for them. And every, it's funny, because now Maranatha, she's sick, she's a total middle child, I love her. But she'll say things like, you love Annabelle more than me. And I'll be like, you know, you're right. I really do that, because, you know, I told her, I'm like, sweetie, when you say that stuff, you know, that's not true, right? She's like, I know. I'm like, you're trying to hurt my feelings? She's like, yeah. I'm like, stop doing that. It hurts. So I'm like, every time you say something silly, I'm going to make fun of you about it. I was, I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> so she said, she'll say, she's in the tennis, she's like, you love Annabelle more than me. I'm like, I just kind of smile. I'm like, it's true. And then she starts to giggle, you know? You know why? Because my daughter knows that I love her and I want to bless her and I want her to smile. I don't want to make her mad. I don't want to hurt her. I want her life to be golden. And, and my friends, listen, God desires not only to bless you, but also to keep you. And that word keep, that's a sweet covenantal word right there. What are the things that you keep, that you delight in, that you're like, wow, that you nurture and you care about? That's what God wants to do with you and me. He wants to bless you and he wants to keep you. He wants to protect you. He wants to hold on to you. That's the way God feels about you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. Now God's face shining upon you, that's rad. It's, it's, it's God's joy radiating from him to you. God's desire is to shine his face upon you. It's beautiful language. Do you realize that every moment of your life, God wants to radiate the joy of his face and his personhood upon you? That's what he wants to do. Notice, the Lord make his face shine upon you and what? And be gracious to you. That word gracious, you know what it means? It means God's unearned, undeserved favor. Do you realize that if you're here today and you are in Christ, you are living in God's unearned, undeserved favor. God has favor upon your life. That is a radical reality. God wants to shine his face and his joy upon you, and he wants to lavish his favor upon you. We get the word favorite from the word favor. Now, it's not a, when we say favorite, we always think about it in a competition, but God doesn't have a limited amount of grace that he needs to kind of divide up like a pie. He wants to bestow his grace upon your life. And not only grace to save, but grace to be transformed. And not only grace to be transformed, but grace to be empowered. And not only grace to be empowered, but grace that you can be a vehicle to push out into the world. He wants to shine his face upon you. And that is what he does in Christ. My friends, we need to Walk in God's favor. Now, I get nervous sometimes because I've been around church long enough that when people start talking about favor, they're always talking about money. As if money is God's favor. Now, listen, for some people, it will be a financial favor. But that is something they need to be faithful and fruitful in. It doesn't matter if it's financial. God's favor is so much more. That's, that's the true riches isn't it? God's favor is the ultimate riches. God's grace, undeserved and unearned, is absolutely profound for our lives. And then it says, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. 
That's awesome, isn't it? God's lifting up his countenance. The, the pictures of the sun rising. As the sun is being lifted up in the sky, God's countenance, God's gaze is bearing down, and may he give you peace. Now, you guys know, because we've talked about it a lot, that word peace, it's the Hebrew word shalom, right? And shalom doesn't just mean we used to be enemies and now we're friends, a cessation of hostilities. I share with you that true biblical peace is the way things ought to be. It's God bringing everything together in universal flourishing. So when it says, may he lift up this countenance upon you and give you peace, God wants you and I to be part of the fabric of all of God's good creation that he is bringing all things together and making it right. And God wants to bestow that in us through Christ. Because first we are at peace with God and then he gives us the peace of God. God's peace comes to us through Jesus. Now, as I invite the worship team to come on out as we close this out, notice how this chapter ends. So they shall put my name on the children of Israel and I will bless them. That word, put my name, it's literally the word invoke. And that's where the idea of an invocation comes from. It literally means to place the name of somebody on it. And so God's desire for the priests is to invoke or put the name of God on the people. Now, we've said it many times that all of us are called to be priests of the Most High God. The Reformers call that the priesthood of all believers. They get it out of 1 Peter chapter 2, where it says that we are a kingdom of priests. So as an action plan for you, I believe God wants each one of us to put the name of God on other people. That we proclaim the name of God on people we meet. When I was, I was away this weekend in Montana at a church and I was doing a message on Matthew chapter 5. You guys have heard me do this message. The one where for our enemies we should love, bless, do good, and pray. Remember Jesus said that? That's how we deal with conflict. We love our enemies. We bless those who curse us. We pray for those people who persecute us. And we love, bless, do good, and pray. We pray for those who spitefully use us. That's our ethics. That's what we do. And my friends, listen. When people think about our lives, they should think about us blessing them in the name of God. Too often people think about us like, they, like Malchus would have thought of Peter. Remember in the garden when Peter was Jesus' disciple and he took off that sword and cut off Malchus' ear? Jesus had to heal the wound by his own follower against somebody. When people think about the followers of Jesus, they should think about us as people who bless people who proclaim the name of the Lord over people. You know what's amazing? When someone says something mean to you, if you say, listen, I'm so sorry that I would provoke that in you, but I believe God wants to do a great work, so I'm sorry, and I believe God loves you. God loves me. He's working on me. I'm in process. You can't have an argument with that person, no matter how hard you try. When someone says, I don't believe in God, I'm listening that God loves you. He sent his own son. God wants his blessing and his grace, his countenance to shine upon you. So they shall put my name upon the children of Israel. I will bless them. The job of the priest was to put God's name on the people, and it was God's job to do the blessing. So listen, the knob on our side of the wall is to invoke the and listen, in a negative world, invoking the name of God is so countercultural and so rebellious against a negative world. So, brothers and sisters, starting tonight, put the name of God on people. Proclaim God's favor and his love on them. 
and let God bless them. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts and pray.